some members will be attending this morning's meeting uh, tele conference, video conference, video conference now, um, and witnesses will be briefing us um, via video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Just to remind members to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. Um, so item number one. Nope, I just unmuted. Nope. Item number one then is apologies. We have apologies from Stuart Dixon due to ongoing illness and we also have apologies this morning from Gordon Dunn and Sinead McLaughlin and John Stewart will be joining us a little bit later. Um, okay, so moving on then to item number two, which is our draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of your draft minutes at page five on your pack from um, the 8th of July meeting. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Yes. Okay, thank yep. you. Um, we're going to come back to chairs for business after the, the first briefing. So um, I'd just like to welcome to the meeting this morning um, Gareth Hetherington, Owen Guinness and Edmund Burney. Um, who are briefing us from the Economic Policy Centre at Ulster University. There is a clerk's memo at page 15 of your packs, a briefing paper from the Policy Centre at page 17, and an updated briefing paper then at page 33. Um, can everybody hear us okay? And they're all in yep, spotlight. Yep, they're all in the spotlight, Good yeah. morning. Um, I just Good hand morning. over to you, and um, if you want to give us a, an opening statement, and then we'll open it up to questions. Thank you, uh, Chair, for, for that introduction and, and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, so I'm only going to uh, take very few minutes uh, by, by way of, of introduction uh, because I'm conscious of the first thing. I know you said in your introductory comments, your team has, they are, your committee has um, the, the published reports. Um, but I understand it's your preference that we take or that, that we give you the opportunity to ask as, as many questions um, as, as, as possible. Uh, the one point just that I would make, Chair, is I'm also aware of the uh, correspondence you made available to the other uh, committee chairs uh, a, a few weeks ago. Um, that was in, I received that from the, uh, the Finance Committee Chair in respect to research that I had given to the Finance Minister uh, a few weeks back. I would say that the um, the findings of, of the work that your committee had done was very consistent with the research uh, that, that I had, had carried out for, for the finance um, department. So I, I think that we're all broadly on, on the same page in, in respect to the scale of the challenges that, that, that face us. And, and obviously we stand ready to help um, all parts of, of the assembly and the executive uh, with any economic advice that, that we're able to, to give. Um, I'm going to conclude just by introducing my two colleagues and then they're both going to say a, a few words of introduction. Uh, one, Esmond Burney, who's a senior economist in the Ulster University Business School, who's been working closely with us. And the other, uh, Dr. Owen McGuinness, um, who's senior economist with me in the Economic uh, Policy Centre. So I'll hand over to Owen first. He'll just make a few comments. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah, sorry, apologies. That's on mute now. Um, and just I suppose there's two questions generally with with you know a recession like this, um, and that's usually how deep the recession might be, and then secondly, how long it might take us to get back um, from us. So I'm just going to Desmond's going to talk a little to the second question. On the first question, I suppose what we're what you have the two papers in front of you, and you'll kind of see from both of those that we began with thinking you know around about. Uh, Nine nine percent thereabouts um, drop in GVA in this year. Um, we felt at that stage that was about as all this year was probably the 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 level at which we could look at. We revised that again um, upwards um, in June when we were beginning to see the, the impacts of the shutdown on, on local sectors, and that went up to sort of around about the 12, 12.5% mark. Um, we, we still feel in the, the recent work we're doing at the moment in terms of what the recovery might look like, we still feel that in a sense it's going to be a very deep um, recession in 2020, perhaps not as deep as first thought, um, but the, and there's questions around that um, whether Northern Ireland might be worse than, than other parts of the uh, the UK um, or or indeed might, might fare better. So there's a few questions around that. At the, at the moment, we're kind of still sticking around the sort of 12% mark um, for 
the drop in GVA in this year. Um, and then it kind of then comes into a question of how quickly we'll go back. Um, one other point, I suppose, left out from the, the papers that we did was a sense that, you know, I suppose a very strong sense that this recession won't affect all sectors equally. And there are sectors, obviously, through physical distancing. There are fe- sectors that will be more impacted by um, demand in the impacts of demand coming back or not coming back. And then it won't affect all places equally. The second paper we looked at looked across the local government districts. And you can see from that, depending on sectoral concentrations in different places, some areas more likely to be are likely to be impacted worse than others. Um, and I suppose that then leads on to the questions of how quickly we might come back from this. And I'll pass over to Esmond um, to say a few things on that. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Owen. Thank you very much, Chair. In terms of that question, it's an important one. If we sort of think of where the economy was at at the start of this year, and so it's a question of how long does it take us to sort of claw our way back to that position in terms of total output, activity, income, people's livelihoods, uh, critically, in other words. Well, uh, various Cast do exist, particularly for the UK economy. Uh, back in the middle of June, Ernst & Young uh, took the average across forecasts for the UK economy and directed they would take the UK economy, so that's the totality of the UK, three years to get back to the position it was in pre-COVID lockdown recession. Yesterday, the Office for Budget Responsibility in London produced uh, their most uh, recent report, most up-to-date report, and they reckoned for the UK economy between two and at worst four and a half years to return to the pre-lockdown, pre-COVID level of output. So I think on the basis of those results, which admittedly are for the UK in total rather than Northern Ireland as a particular region with its own particular mix of sectors and its own particular uh, mix of advantages and disadvantages, economically speaking. But I think we can probably suggest, uh, right, certainly this would be my feeling, that um, a good scenario would be for the Northern Ireland economy to take about three years to get back to where it was. A sort of middling scenario would be four years and a bad case would be five years. And just as a point of reference, if we go back 12 years to the previous recession, uh, after the banking crisis, it took, uh, in terms of NISRA data, it took the Northern Ireland economy between seven and eight years to return to where it was before. So uh, between three and five years might sound bad, and in many ways it is bad, but it's not as bad as the last time. And I do recognise, obviously, that every recession is unique in its own regard. But uh, thank you very much. I think that finishes our opening remarks. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I guess I will open up then um, with with questions. Um, obviously, <coughs> like we all we all see the scale of the, the challenge in front of us now, and you have given some um, figures there in your papers around, for example, the number of people who have been furloughed. Um, in terms of where we are now and people re- returning to work, is there an understanding of um, the scale of unemployment that might result from those who are furloughed but who may not have jobs to return to at this point? Um, I'll take that one initially and, and then maybe certain the other guys can uh, contribute. Certainly the um, estimates, the, the, the data that was released by HMRC showed there were 212,000 um, people from Northern Ireland uh, on, on the job retention scheme. Um, that is likely to have peaked slightly higher. It's likely to be in the region of around 220,000. Um, th- we are entering a critical period now in the next a uh, short number of weeks to understand um, the extent to which either a people will return to the extent to which people will return to work from furlough or companies will make decisions and lay people off. Um, now some evidence uh, would suggest from uh, again at a UK wide level and it's what, what we have seen is that various countries and regions have been broadly similar in, in terms of the scale of impact. Um, but at the UK-wide level, there's some survey evidence to suggest 20 to 25 percent 
of those people currently on furlough um, uh, will will not return to work. They will find their way onto uh, the the unemployment register. So on that basis, you're you're looking at forty to fifty thousand uh, additional uh, people uh, losing. Uh, their job. In addition to that, of that 40,000 who are um, going to, to move into unemployment, um, some research from the US would would suggest, and this is previous recessions, not now, but around 30 to 40 percent of people who go on to unemployment as a result of a recession don't then move back into the jobs they had uh, before. So um, that's that's a significant level of uh, of scarring. So um, we are, as I said, we're entering this critical period now where companies are going to have to make decisions about retaining or, or letting staff go because of the timing of the the rollout or the, the ending of the, the JRS, the job retention scheme. Um, I, I'll conclude with those comments if, if owner Esmond also want to make a comment. Yeah, ju just on that, Chair, I mean, in, in addition to what Gareth has said, um, there, I think you're, you could be looking potentially, our kind of estimates, if those numbers are correct, would be on a peak unemployment, if you like, of around about 12% being the rate um, that the, the unemployment could go up to. Um, now, you're then kind of, you're, you're, I suppose you have two questions around this or two issues around it. One is, you know, what can be done to maybe keep people in work as much as possible in terms of, you know, the, the, the length of the JRS, though that obviously can't run forever. Um, and then the second thing you're, you're looking at is how quickly can we get people back um, to work or indeed keep them in training and education um, that bit longer in, in a sense, maybe to prevent people falling out of the labour market. Um, completely. So there are those kinds of issues that become critical here if we're looking at um, unemployment rates of around about you know 10% plus. Um, we're back to a, a period we haven't seen for a long time. Um, and it, then it becomes a question of how quickly we can reallocate people into different types of jobs or uh, upskill people and, and do all of the things that we need to activate people back into the labour market. Uh, Chair, if I could just add to what Gareth and Owen said there, the uh, forecast produced yesterday by the Office for Budget Responsibility, and this is with regard to UK unemployment rates, but it is very similar to uh, um, our own thinking, and they're suggesting a peak uh, of between 10 and 13 percent, unfortunately. We, we all recognise the importance of the interventions that we have seen in terms of the job retention scheme um, and, you know, going forward, the need for some flexibility around that, particularly perhaps on a sectoral level or a regional level, depending on, um, you know, future lockdowns or, or those um, are responding to the, the challenges of individual sectors. Um, and I suppose that's that's one of the things that we need to make a, a case around. But but equally in terms of now planning for the recovery, um, the the types of measures and, and you've started to talk about them there in terms of keeping people in skills or or sorry and training for um, our upskilling um, and other interventions that um, that might be needed or that might make a, a real difference at this point in time. Um, is there? things in, in that sphere that you could perhaps talk to and um, we've seen the the economic recovery paper that the department has brought forward but the types of interventions that might be needed um are we is there an understanding of what that might look like um yeah i mean sherry the, the, the so there are a number of things that um i suppose you, you as a, that the executive as a whole can do i mean one of the i suppose underlying themes that, that have noticed uh, it, it, and it's come through in respect of the um, of the department's uh, strategy or, or paper is that a whole of government response is, is required here. So no one individual minister or department uh, can act independently or acting independently will bring about uh, the, a recovery at the pace that which we require. So that sort of whole of government response, I think, is the first point that I, I would make um, is is important. Um, th there are some things, I mean, they 
we and obviously we, we work for a university, so we would say this, but uh, skills uh, development and no one touched on this um, is a very important um, uh, aspect of, of, of our recovery program. We have 25,000 young people typically who leave education each year uh, and, and move into the labour market. Uh, this year, there won't be 25,000 jobs for those young people to, to take advantage of. So I suppose our simple advice to um, to young people who would otherwise be thinking of trying to find a job is to stay in education um, there and, and move up the, the skills or, or, or qualifications ladder. Um, that means, I suppose, from a DFE, Department for the Economy, uh, perspective, um, allowing for additional provision and, and being able to fund additional provision to allow uh, a greater numbers of, of people to, to stay um, in employment. In terms of other skills programs, and Owen touched on this, in terms of reskilling, um, the, the types of skills programs that are the most successful, certainly in our experience, are the program or skills programs that work in partnership between education institutions and employers. Um, those, those tend to develop the, both the right technical and, and academic skills, if you like, on the one hand, but also then the, the appropriate uh, practical and employability skills that, that give people um, the, the ability to move and transition from education into uh, full-time employment. So any programs that... Um, combine both, uh, as I say, practical um, on-the-job training along with classroom training, other sorts of programs that, that tend to be more successful um, in, in the longer term. A couple of other points uh, that I would make, and uh, I would reference your, your, your committee's correspondence a, a few weeks back, which focused on, uh, quite rightly, on, on getting our towns and city centres um, back open and, and up and running again. And in the short time uh, that from you released your papers until now, we have started to see a significant um, opening up. Um, but one thing that is, is striking is that for, for them to be sustainable, uh, those whether it's restaurants, coffee shops, sh um, retail outlets, etc., um, we need to bring other life back to our towns and city centres. And they're certainly within the control of government. Um, we, we need to start to look at ways in which we can safely, and I stress safely, um, move, uh, get civil servants not just back to work, but back to work in uh, in their offices in, in towns and city centres. Um, there's very much, we, we, we need to learn to live with uh, this coronavirus um, and you, it's uh, until we get a, a, a vaccine which is uh, I'm not a, a virologist or um, a health professional but it certainly seems to be 12, 18, 24 months away so sitting in lockdown or with the economy um, in, in relative cold storage for that period of time is a non-starter we need to start to learn to live with this um, virus and, and work uh, are around it and the normal business of government needs to resume that includes getting uh, people not just back to work but back to the work in their offices where, where that's safe. Um, so I do think that there's uh, some work that should be done uh, or could be done there. Um, another area that I would say and, and in sort of consistent with my or the whole of government response is uh, investment in um, in, in, the, in the job centre, stroke jobs and benefits offices infrastructure, um, you know, three months ago we had a record low unemployment, and we had a labour market that was buoyant. We had a labour market that was creating jobs. Um, so, in, in a very short space of time, we're moving to um, a, a, an environment where job centres are going to have to be dealing with and working with a lot more people and a much more challenging um, uh, labour market. And they will need to be resourced appropriately in order to transition as many people as possible back into work as, as quickly as possible. So I think those are those are a couple of points that I would make and, and perhaps that the guys may also have some other uh, ideas or comments.
Chair, I would just have one comment maybe to add to Gareth's point there, and that is in around one of your correspondents, I think, to um, uh, Solis, was around the idea of partnership and the, and the key part that that can play, uh, both across government, but also with other actors, you know, local government. Um, and, that, and I think that's absolutely critical. And it, we're in a kind of previous, in a previous experience, um, I would have been involved around the jobs action plan, uh, plans that actually ran out across the, the south after the last recession. And I think partnership across government, but also partnership, you know, at a, a sub-regional level proved critical to those. I mean, in in a sense, first of all, you had a, an action plan that had sort of targets set with it and, and measurable targets. But I think also you had that that sense that people were gathering at a regional as well as a kind of set on a sectoral basis to say, well, what can be done here with government kind of taking, it was a kind of a to and fro conversation with that. That proved pretty successful in terms of animating the, the SME base, which is really critical um, here outside, you know, the kind of some of the FDI centres, but it'll be absolutely critical to animate that SME um, base in terms of kind of job creation and, and indeed job retention um, over the next four to five years. So I think partnership is very important. completely agree with that and also um, in terms of that sub-regional approach and like, it's one of the things you reference in your, your paper but the, the role of local government I think is going to be critical I suppose in terms of um, that local response and, and ensuring that you know um, by council area or by town or city that there is an appropriate response um, to reinvigorate the, the local economy and I suppose some of the things that you have, have talked about there um, are the type of responses we need to see in the, the immediate term and in, in the short term. But obviously, even pre-COVID, we had, um, you know, we had very low productivity here in, in the lowest in these islands. We have, you know, high levels of, of economic inactivity. And in terms of addressing those challenges in uh, the economic and societal uh, recovery from COVID, as well as, you know, dealing with the challenges around Brexit and obviously then, um, uh, longer term as well in terms of, of, of the climate emergency, the types of um, interventions and responses that, that we may need to see. Um, is there work being done in, the, in that respect as well? I mean, certainly uh, we, we are looking at, there's, there's, you're, you're absolutely right to pick out both the, the short term uh, immediate steps that, that, that can be taken and obvious for obvious reasons there's been a, a focus on those um, but I you know there's the there's the medium to longer term uh, strategies that that need to be put in place as well and I would say that the um, the, the department's paper in that regard was the first document uh, that I'd seen coming out of government that did start, to, to try to put in place and, 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 and structure some thinking around the medium to long term uh, impacts. Uh, a lot of the work, as I I'd said in, in my comments, a lot of the work that, that we've done is around uh, skills and, and skills development. That tends to be how we um, and how individuals can move up the um, the productivity ladder, if you like, and, and, and which is good for them in terms of their earnings potential, um, but also good for individual businesses and, and the economy as a whole. So that's something that we are, are continuing to do and we're continuing to advise uh, the department on that in respect of their, uh, their, their skill strategies uh, moving forward. Um, and I guess just finally from myself, um, in terms of questions for up to others, um, we're seeing already some sectors are, are returning quicker than others. Um, mm. uh, for example, there was the, the PMI report earlier in the week which showed manufacturing is already uh, recovering to some extent, and while other sectors are obviously lagging behind, in particular the, the, the services sector. Um, in terms of like moving forward, into recovery, um, is there certain sectors that are more resilient or that need additional um, supports that will enable them to recover better? Yeah, I mean, Chilwell, you know there are, I suppose the sectors that, and, and the people who have been most impacted 
um, by uh, the, the, the restrictions tend to be those in lower paid jobs and, and lower skilled jobs. Um, jobs that are low, lower qualification jobs, probably a better way of, of, of describing it. Um, and and they, those jobs tend to be in areas such as retail and, and hospitality, where the social distancing restrictions are likely to have a more significant impact for a longer term. Um, as we move into other sectors which are higher paid and higher skilled, um, the, uh, the social distancing restrictions are less onerous um, on, on the operation of that business, but also typically individuals in those sectors are more able and have the flexibility to work from home. Now, not exclusively, um, but there's a, a greater proportion of, of, of people who are able to do that. And certainly some when, you, when some of the analysis um, and, and research that's been done elsewhere, it's quite uh, striking in terms of people in the top earnings quartile, uh, around 40 to 50 percent uh, are, are able to work from home. People in the bottom earnings quartile, it's, it's in the region of 10 percent are able to work from home. So um, the, the sorts of sectors, again, that, that have been most impacted are, uh, as I say, uh, hospitality, and, and this is for the, the longer term hospitality and, and the likes of retail. The other challenge for, for retail, and this is probably non-food retail to be, to be more specific, um, the high street uh, pre-COVID was facing um, quite significant challenges. Um, and, and this for, from online uh, retailers, and uh, one of the impacts of this uh, pandemic has been to uh, force people to, to move online, to, to do their shopping online, particularly uh, when um, the non-essential shops were closed. Um, so that trend that we've seen of um, increasing online shopping has had a real shunt, um, and, and that's likely to continue. So the challenge that the high street saw pre uh, COVID are likely to um, accelerate uh, as, a, as a result of COVID. That then requires a, a new look at, and, and work had been ongoing uh, to, to uh, consider how, how do we bring life back to the high street um, in, in, in the 21st century. Um, and, and so there was work going, around, going on around uh, reforming business rates um, and, and regeneration of our towns and, and city centres. And when we look at the, the long-term trend, we'd spent the last 40, 50 years moving out of our town centres and city centres, and we're now seeing a drive from uh, councils but, yeah. and also um, the, the executive to put in place plans to make our towns and city centres places where people want to live again, as well as uh, work and um, undertake their leisure activities, etc. So it's uh, it's very much a long term plan to uh, put in place measures to bring about a new town centre and city centre, rather than trying to put in place a plan that preserves our town centres and city centres as they were 10, 15 years ago. Okay, thank you. Um, Gary, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Yes, Chair, um, thanks for that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, huh? yeah. yes, Gary. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Chair, and thanks to, to uh, yourselves for the presentation. Uh, that was very useful. I did get a rundown of that at the Strategic Growth Partnership uh, last week. Um, obviously, there has been a significant opening up of the city centre. Um, many of us who have been out and about in the city centre will have noticed that obviously it isn't as vibrant as it once was. Um, many of our uh, shops or restaurants or cafes uh, continue to struggle. Uh, I've been in a few of them, uh, and we, we even heard in the video this morning around the restaurant no-shows. There's, there's an issue of confidence, obviously, which continues to exist 
uh, and it's going to uh, be there for some time. Uh, the, even the discussion around the wearing of face masks in, in shops, uh, that in itself, whilst, whilst I, I, I can see the merits and, and absolutely um, support that, I can see also where that uh, it creates an issue of almost, well, you know, the virus is still here, it's physically here, and people may not shop as frequently as maybe they, they would have intended to. Another concern that I have is around the the furlough issue, and you did touch on the fact that, you know, it is now decision time because a lot of businesses are now making the decision you know, to, to either bring their staff off furlough or to make them redundant. And one area which I've seen locally is the car industry, where, um, you know, so, some employees have just been said, look, you know, you'll, you'll not be coming off furlough. So uh, my question is around, and the chair asked something similar, but my question, I suppose, is more focused on those where, where the furlough is concerned. Are there any particular areas that are that are of particular concern at this minute in time. I, I I think about and I appreciate retail and hospitalities up there, but I'm thinking about you know the car industry, manufacturing. Are there any other areas where there's particular concern? And I I'll make a few comments on it. Say, oh, and well, if something, I, I'll I'll be brief. I mean, you the, the car you're, you're, the car industry, car showrooms. I, I guess what you could pick out as being particularly vulnerable because they you know they represent a large uh, discretionary spend at a time when a lot of people are going to be uncertain and um, you, you so it, it's quite easy to make the decision I'll, I'll hold off drive the car for another year wait and see um, and, and if a lot of people make that decision then that that creates extreme stress in in the likes of, of, of uh, areas like car sales. Um, manufacturing um, is manufacturing is an interesting one. I think the key, well, there's a number of key issues within uh, manufacturing um, that that I would draw out. One is in respect to supply chains. Mm -hmm. So um, our manufacturing sector as a whole in, in Northern Ireland is our, our biggest exporter, uh, but it's also a very significant importer. So uh, that that requires. Uh, and the way in which global supply chains have been set up, hugely efficient, um, just-in-time systems. Um, and clearly, whenever you have, from across the world, and, and whenever you have different parts of the world shutting down at different times and then opening up at different times, that creates huge disruption in what was a highly efficient, uh, fast-moving uh, supply chain system. So even if you have, even within a manufacturing setting, uh, if, if you've all this uh, equipment, everyone back at work, ready to go, you're reliant on so many external factors that are outside of, of your control. Um, and and th so that's manufacturing as a whole. Some subsectors within manufacturing uh, and Northern Ireland has a high concentration in uh, in aerospace, um, higher concentration than, um, than than for the UK as a whole. Now, historically, that's a good thing. Aerospace is a high value added sector. Um, it, it's high skilled, well paid jobs, etc. This is exactly the sorts of jobs that you would want uh, to be in and to attract here. Um, so that that's a positive. Clearly, aerospace, uh, international air travel has suffered a hugely significant impact that will take years, plural, uh, to return to anything like uh, normality. So if people aren't flying, that creates problems for airlines. If, if airlines have problems, they don't want to buy new planes. That causes problems for Northern Ireland aerospace industry. So um, that is, um, that's a massive issue. My 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 personal view is I think that what we are what we could see um, I wouldn't want to put a percentage on it but it's certainly something I'm sure is being considered aerospace will be judged to be a strategically important sector uh, for for the UK as a whole um, we've seen this government although it's conservative government it, it's maybe departed from previous conservative governments in that it's not afraid to intervene in in the economy. Um, I can see a scenario where the government takes 
a, a an equity stake part nationalizes if you like some of the large aerospace manufacturers because of their strategic long-term importance um, that's something that could happen i can see happening in um it, it, it's in certainly this year before the end of, of this year another area of um, manufacturing as well as subsector is is agri food obviously very important uh, to, to the local economy um, that hasn't been without it that sector hasn't had been without its challenges either um, those servicing um, the consumer or supermarkets uh, directly have been relatively unscathed. Um, they have been able, obviously, we, we, we've been buying more food in, in supermarkets, etc. cetera. Um, so, so they've been able to sell there. But the agri-food sector that's uh, serviced um, accommodation, food services, so hotels, hot restaurants, etc. they've seen their demand um, fall off a cliff. And so, uh, so that even that part of the agri food sector has has been uh, significantly impacted. Um, the, the the chancellor's uh, aid out to help out scheme, let's say um, on balance, I, I think it's 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 not a bad scheme. Uh, encourages people out. That could start to see uh, increased numbers of of people uh, aiding out. Those that are still somewhat apprehensive or anxious. Uh, about going out and, and seeing what it's like. Um, this could be the little financial incentive that just encourages them to do that. So that may help. But to go back to one of the points that I that I'd made to the chair, um, yes, our town centres and our city centres are quieter. But if one of the reasons for that is because we have less people in offices, and as a as a government, as a civil service, or as a as a, a councils. Um, yeah, a lot of those organisations, public bodies in, in general, have their offices open. If they can have people start to return to work safely, and I do stress safely, uh, then th that we, we start to see greater confidence and more money being spent in cafes, restaurants, uh, retail outlets, etc. Yeah. Okay. Just, just to make a brief point, really, on the, on the back of that, I mean, if you think about the kind of drivers of redundancy, generally it's kind of an absence of demand, around there, which Gareth has touched on in terms of the different sectors um, there. And that can vary from sector to sector, depending on your very point you made, people's level of comfort going into shops or restaurants or or indeed, you know, the, the knock-on demand that can have for suppliers to those, um, be it in manufacturing or, or services or wherever. So there's that on the one side um, will, will influence people's decision, firms' decisions about bringing people back off furlough or not. The other thing, and I suppose this is, and there is something there, I think the point's just been made about stimulating demand through people in the town centres, but also maybe public procurement, um, use of public procurement as well in terms of stimulating demand within su supply chains. But there's there's another issue there, I think, around, around that is that firms will tend to make those decisions around redundancies if they're facing financial distress, and that's either, you know, supplier or customers haven't paid them, they've done a job and, and there's a problem along the supply chain that's coming back to them um, or indeed maybe there's been other issues around financial distress that they're now facing so that's that's something and, and that will happen within all sectors you know there'll be some firms there'll be some businesses in in you know in in, in your city center who are, will survive this well because their financial situation was better than others there, there are issues there around fixed costs and so on that I think the Department of Finance and yourselves have been addressing um, well, and that will continue, I think, to be an issue is how people can be helped with some of those fixed costs. Has that not been the thing that tip people over the edge into sort of um, a closure, really? But the financial distress issue on access to finance is a, is a critical one in terms of those decisions. Mm. No, th thanks for that. that. That's a very useful. Um, and I, I suppose that... Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, the city centres at this minute in time, I think, you know, within the old constituency here in Foyle, you know, there's a lot of public sector workers who aren't back to work yet. I think that if we can get those people safely back in 
uh, that will no doubt help your local cafes, your local um, shops, your even your barbers and hairdressers. Because I was surprised, you know, even last week when I went into my own barbers in the city centre, usually very popular, um, uh, but but it was surprisingly quiet. And and he said, look, you know, I don't know what it is. People, um, you know, pe- people maybe just don't have the confidence. Uh, and he was already talking about needing further support and uh, get into next year. Uh, you know, obviously he got great support within the the city centre, but you know, so he's already in this mindset that you know I'm going to need more support to survive. Otherwise, I'm going to have to cut hours for people. So I, I, going forward, I think I uh, appreciate you've, you've outlined sort of a number of reasonable recovery periods uh, and time frames. But I think that in, in the short term, you know, there may need to be other targeted measures looked at, uh, whether it be to support customers into the the uh, premises. But I think in terms of the business owners themselves, there, there's clearly uh, trends which are starting to emerge that, that will require maybe targeted support in um, collaboration with our local councils as well. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, can I just pick up on a couple of Gary's points there? Um, in relation to the me- the support measures that are in place, and yet you mentioned there are one around fixed costs, is there additional measures that we should be making a case for at this point? Um, and like access to finance has been one, uh, has been an issue that has been highlighted to us um, throughout the crisis. And, you know, initially we had the C bills that was difficult to access, and then we, we've seen various permutations of that that ha- has um, alleviated some of the, the issues but um, we, we do still hear that issue being highlighted and also the reluctance of um, businesses to take on additional debt is, is something that is, has been highlighted to us um, and then just secondly in relation to that discretionary spend that you talked about there um, we had heard you know um, ideas that there may be pent up demand that people who have continue to have their job and to work from home and um, may not have been spending money at the same level as previously, may have been like waiting patiently to get out the doors to, to spend again. Are, are we seeing that trend actually realise or is it something that hasn't really um, impacted so far? I can maybe touch on the last point a little bit, Chair, around the kind of footfall. I mean, some of the initial figures coming out on that w- would suggest that it you know both both locally here and, and from other places is that the the there is good kind of good demand at weekends weekends seem to be busy but it's the it's the weekdays that are are quiet and i think your your previous um gary middleton mentioned that point in you know in uh, Derry city you find it in my own local town here as well that the weekdays are quieter I think when you speak to um, retailers and other providers of services than, um, than they've seen. And I suspect that is the point that Gareth has made. It's about getting people safely back um, into their, their place of work a bit more. Um, I think when you're there, you know, a wander up the town at, at lunchtime and people do tend to, you know, spend, leave a bit of money behind them, leave a bit more money behind them than they do if they're, they're working from home. Um, if they're able to work from home, so I think it's it's around it's around those making people feel comfortable and safe about going in, of course, but also having people there in the first place to do that. I think is is critical. The, the one comment I would make just on on top of that, chair, is we, we are um, we're, we're looking at a situation now where a lot of the evidence is anecdotal, and um, as researchers, I I, I don't like, I don't like anecdotal evidence. Uh, because what tends to happen is whoever shouts the loudest, that's the story that gets heard rather than perhaps where the biggest problem is. So uh, that, that, I, that, I'm saying that and I'm going to start giving some anecdotal evidence now. Um, but that is uh, certainly people that I've been talking to in, in the construction sector, for example, um, have, have seen quite a significant uh, demand for their services at least in the short term, whenever they return to work. Now, a lot of that is because um, obviously they have to shut down very quickly. So there is a lot of demand for, for projects that had been started to have those projects completed. Um, uh, in, in terms of new work, that's less clear uh, how, how that's going to pick up. So people in the construction sector uh, have, in, or in general, 
you know, reasonably busy as of now or the, for the next few months. Um, where they'll be in three to six months' time, there does seem to be some uh, some greater level of um, of uncertainty. Um, some other things that I have heard, though, in respect of, of um, construction is that people aren't going on holiday. I suppose two things have happened. One, people have spent a lot more time at home in their house, and so therefore they, they, they're starting to value their house or recognise uh, the importance of, of their house. That's the first thing that's happened. And the second thing that's happened is they're much less likely to be going on holiday this year. So that's perhaps some money that they otherwise are, uh, that they maybe budgeted to spend and they're not going to now. And they're wanting to spend that on their house or in their, their back garden or, or whatever it happens to be. So there's maybe some slightly smaller um construction related spend happening within the economy that, that around house improvements um that, that that opens up a whole lot of other areas for you know the medium to longer term um and, and so and i think chair it was you that had mentioned that you talked about um greener policies environmentally friendly policies um or energy uh, efficient policies um, and we started to see some of those being announced um, by the Chancellor across the water. Obviously, those are devolved issues. There may be um, some programmes that, that we may want to uh, consider here, whether you're making um, houses more energy efficient, uh, re uh, refurbing or fitting new boilers, solar panels, those, those sorts of energy efficiency and, and greener energy uh, projects have the advantage of one, obviously being um, ticking the uh, environmental box, but two, creates demand within the economy for certain sectors such as uh, such as construction. No, I think um, absolutely government is going to have a key role here. I think retrofitting is a bit of a no-brainer when it comes to um, you know, reinvigorating that construction sector, but also meeting the, the, the challenges of decarbonisation. And I think it's something that we need to see, for example, if we are going to see support for the likes of the aerospace sector, then, you know, it needs to be tied to decarbonisation targets as well. Um, um, I'm going to hand over now to, to John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I was actually just going to touch on, on the construction industry um, itself. Over this last number of weeks, we've had several presentations to the committee, one on skills. Last week, we had Invest in. Uh, and I'm beginning to wonder, are we in danger of seeking the, the perfect and missing the good in the sense of that we want to be somewhere in the economy, uh, which is all very laudable, but given the huge uncertainty that's, that's out there, both locally and globally, that we're going to miss the opportunity in terms of pumping money into the economy through the construction industry uh, and others. And I'm not just, I don't even mean uh, major construction. It is those house improvements, uh, th th those garden schemes, th those schemes that people have put off for a number of years because maybe they went on holidays, but now they're uncomfortable or, or don't want to go on holidays, so they're spending money uh, at home. So I'm wondering. Are, are we at a stage now where we have to consolidate what we have rather than uh, chase the end of the rainbow? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with, with your, your comments. Um, as we, my, there's, there isn't going to be one single thing uh, that, that's going to solve the problem for any one sector. And particularly what we've noticed is um, well, I suppose there's there's when I look at the construction industry, you, you've got the small jobs and you have the big jobs. And I'll, I'll talk about the big jobs in a second, but certainly within those small jobs, whether it's people uh, renovating their house, putting an extension in their house, doing something to their garden, those those types of projects are undertaken by small construction companies. Um, and uh, that is whether you know, whether those people have people have additional money because they're not going on holiday or because they've taken advantage of perhaps a mortgage holiday for two or three months. But anything that then starts to get money being spent on uh, in, in improvements uh, in, in at the in the home will be good for small construction sole traders. Um, in, in, in the economy. That's the first point I would make in, in respect of 
uh, the, the small construction companies and, and I suppose private sector spending. Um, the point that I'd made earlier about from, from the construction sector, a lot of work in general to get existing projects done, new projects, um, much greater levels of uncertainty. That then brings into play the role of, uh, of government and, and public sector to fast track uh, public sector infrastructure projects and regeneration projects. Um, and that, this is obviously in, in partnership between central and, and local government and also ties into the city deals uh, work that's going on. The one point that I would make, so one, we want to accelerate those, but two, I think we also have to recognise that in general, from a government procurement point of view, it's quite hard, it's not quite hard, it's very hard for those small companies, a uh, large number of small companies to be able to access um, those uh, public procurements. Now, they could be brought in as part of you know subcontractors to larger construction firms, um, but uh, as, as part of the overall thinking, we need to consider how we can get as many uh, local firms with um, you know local employment um, involved in in the delivery of um, government procurement uh, contracts. Okay, and just in terms then of uh, consumer habits, uh, again, those people who have been lucky enough to be furloughed. Uh, and those who have been able to work from home or continue to work um, have still a certain amount of disposable income and are perhaps or there's certainly you know you don't like anecdotal evidence but there's certainly anecdotal evidence that they are consuming in a different way particularly online and you mentioned the, the challenges facing our town centres and city centres even before COVID had hit I was just reading a report earlier that suggested that Amazon in the first quarter of the year's profits were $33 million an hour. Now, that's globally, uh, which is an impressive spreadsheet uh, to them. But uh, it, it comes to the question then of the ability of the executive, because the, the, the executive could pump money into the local economy, could create more jobs. But if the, the taxes of those jobs are leaving these shores, um, and if those jobs are, are, even if taxes aren't being paid on that, and I noticed that... Uh, Apple have won their case this morning that uh, 13 billion euro, uh, which they originally were summons to pay to uh, the Dublin government, has now been they, they've won that case. That that doesn't have to be paid. Uh, now the rights or wrongs of that case to your average payee, P, P A Y E worker uh, will be mind-boggling in the sense of it, it, someone's got their sums dramatically wrong. If one case it was 13 billion, that's no, you don't have to pay anything. But I'd, we're not going to that today. But taxation. If would the executive or would our local economy benefit from the executive having tax varying powers? Um, well, yeah, I suppose any yes, yes. If if you do the right things with it, no. If you're going to do the wrong things with it, I think it's the short answer to that. Um, and I'm not going to start to get into well, what are the right things and what are the wrong things, but. I suppose there, there's another point here that I want in, in respect of the, of the points that uh, you were you, you were making is online retail versus high street retail, and uh, I, I suppose in my mind I can't get away from the fact that you know our high street retailers have to pay high, higher business rates in towns and city centres than the online retailer who's in a warehouse out of town. Uh, now, and, and a lot of work is being done or a lot of thought had been going into how we reform business rates um, and, and that's a separate issue. In terms of online retail, part of the solution, in my view, has to be some form of digital or online tax. And that is whether that's 1% or 2% on, on online uh, purchases um, and, and that money then can be that's additional revenue that could be used to offset lower tax, lower business rates, for example, in, in our towns and, and city centres. The issue here, and I'm sort of, in, in my mind, always saying, well, what can the executive do about that? Um, I don't think any, I don't think the executive can do a huge amount about it. I don't think any individual national government can, can do anything about it. I think that this requires um, national governments working uh, collectively. 
uh, to be able to to tackle um, this issue, um, uh, it, which means that it's a long term issue. It's going to take a long time to 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 resolve. But nevertheless, you know the problems that we are facing on our high street here are are not unique to this place. They're across these islands. You know. We, across the, the developed world. So um, I, I don't see um, a, a major, you know, it, I think we're, we're pushing on an open door, but because um, it's, it, it's a global response that's required, uh, I, I think it's going to take a, a long time. The only thing about our, high, our towns and, and city high streets is, and I admit it in, in, the, in my in an answer to a previous question, was we, we need to we need to be careful that we don't try to have a, an idealised view of what the high street was like fifteen or twenty years ago, and that's what we need to preserve. That isn't going to work either. Um, I do think, though, we we need to get more people living in our towns and city centres again. That then, in turn, creates the critical mass to, that helps support our um, you know, retailers, cafes, hospitality sector, et cetera. Um, and if we change, because the online retail, um, or sorry, the, the, the high street retail footprint will continue to uh, diminish because the online retail uh, share will continue to, to increase. So that, that, that needs to be, uh, th those, all those aspects need to be balanced when, when we're coming up with a, a regeneration plan for the high street moving forward. Okay. Could I um, uh, make two very brief comments further to uh, what Gareth has been saying and, and uh, dealing with two points that Mr. O'Dowd made? Uh, the first with respect to uh, sort of trying to pump prime the economy by um, almost like public works infrastructure investment. Now, very importantly, we need more infrastructure in Northern Ireland. We've got problems with certain roads. We know about the issues around Northern Ireland water. And of course, digital has been getting a lot of unrightly uh, prominence recently. But I would say, and it's a bit further to Mr. O'Dowd's point about, well, you can give people jobs, but then they spend the money and it flows out of the region. Uh, do keep in mind that these big infrastructure projects and I think this is a bit different from Gareth's point about small building and construction and retrofitting of boilers and all that sort of stuff. Big infrastructure is heavily capital intensive. So it's not going to create tens of thousands of jobs. We probably need to do it for the sake of our economy and future generations, but don't see that in itself as being the solution to higher unemployment. And also very briefly uh, to Mr. O'Dowd's question of tax varying powers, and it's something I've, along with others, written about in the past and spoken about. Yes, I think Stormont should have wider tax varying powers, but Gareth is right. With power comes responsibility. It all depends how you use it. And don't expect there to be a sort of fiscal magic bullet that's where uh, something that will solve all our economic problems. You can reform the rate system. Someday in the future, we might go back to corporation tax, air passenger duty, or whatever, but none of them by themselves will create an economic miracle. Thank you. On taxation and how you tax, obviously goes to the core of many political uh, debates, disputes, and arguments. Uh, who, who should be taxed and how it's paid? But uh, thank, thank you for your responses. Thank you. Um, Claire, can we bring Claire into the spotlight, please? Sorry. Oh, Thank everyone. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm just touching on a number of points that we've already been discussing. I suppose the first one that I'm concerned about is in relation to furlough and what that's going to look like in the next number of weeks. Um, if businesses are unfortunately having to make those decisions where they're going to be making their employees redundant, I suppose I'm concerned about the cost that that, that will have to those businesses themselves. And I'm, I'm not entirely clear if, you know, how much that will be and, you know, on what basis of employment and contracts, you know, that they will be able to make people redundant. 
them. But I think that's also a risk for them. So whilst they're trying to minimise their overheads and overheads in terms of staffing, that redundancy cost will also make them vulnerable in, in terms of you know what they will have to to pay out. Um, you've touched on this as well in relation to I suppose staycations, and I represent an area which is heavily reliant on tourism. And indeed, over the weekend and and the past couple of days, we have seen many people um in the coast, which is good to see. Mm. Um, However, I, I nearly worry is that a false sense of busyness, if you like. Um, you know, I'm hearing from some local uh, restaurants in particular where they're saying that they aren't as busy. People do still seem to be nervous in relation to, to coming out and using those services. And indeed, some of the alternative businesses that they picked up during lockdown on um, delivery services or, or things like that were much more successful for them. So I suppose on one hand, they have been able to diversify their business when they did um, have... Uh, less opportunities you know to, to do it in house if you like um and i think moving forward whilst there's opportunities in that i think we have to be mindful of those things um so yeah and, and i suppose then just even to go further into the opportunities and garth you touched on it in relation to the high street um i i've been really impressed how you know a lot of local businesses particularly the independent businesses have been able to to get online and i, I think moving forward that's something that they should you know continue to do because i think that online presence versus that high st street presence has has been really been quite successful for many of the local independent businesses that i'm aware of and you know i, I would like to have seen um councils and their support for businesses and indeed they you know the executive rollout programs that does encourage that that online presence because i do think that's the way the world's going i think that was the case before lockdown and i think certainly um it, it will be moving forward and people now have gotten used to to shopping online and they, they like the convenience of it um you know so i i, I do think it's something that you know won't just disappear again with lockdown and if we are genuinely going to stimulate our economy then i think it's these things that we need to look towards um, I suppose the other question, and this is more of a crystal ball question in terms of what could happen in the future, um, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. And I'm sure if we were reviewing, and, and I hope we do do this at some point, we review how we approached uh, lockdown and how we did it in terms of the economy. Um, you know, what would we do if we find ourselves in a situation again like this in the future? And it could even be the near future whenever the autumn and the winter comes forward and some people are, are nervous around that. Um, is there anything that you would suggest that we could do better so that we don't put our economy into lockdown um, when we're, we're trying to address the public health issue? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And I suppose it's something that, that we've uh, started to, uh, to talk about and to think about because um, you know, a lot of businesses are in extreme stress uh, caused by the lockdown. They've had to make an investment to open up again and a second lockdown uh, could uh, is the difference between uh, surviving and, and, and closure. Um, I, I think that the, the big difference next time around um, is, and again, I'm not, I'm not a health professional, but as we start to open up, it is likely we're going to see the number of cases um, increase. Um, but the, uh, the fundamental uh, answer to, to your question, I think, is an effective, uh, whatever you want to call it, track and trace system where um, it is identified uh, v very quickly and um, we can put in place uh, localised um, lockdowns for uh, people and, and, and who they've been in touch with. Um, even the localised lockdowns that, that we're starting to see uh, across the water, whether it's Leicester, for example, that's that's a big area to lock down. Okay. In the scale of the UK, perhaps not, but nevertheless, that's a big area. Um, I, I think that what we would be wanting to see is, as I say, a much more uh, effective test track trace system that as soon as we're seeing it, uh, at the first sight of it flare up, uh, we're able to um, deal with that uh, very, very quickly so that it doesn't spread uh, throughout uh, the, the broader community because we've seen how infectious uh, this uh, this virus uh, can be. So that's I, I kind of see that as probably the most important element in preventing another NIY lockdown um, in, 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 you know, in the months ahead.
Are, are you seeing that happening now in Northern Ireland? Certainly the feedback that I'm getting from businesses is a lot of them don't really understand what it is, what their responsibility is around that. Um, you know, as an elected representative who, who kind of uh, reviews all the information that's coming out from the executive, I'm not entirely sure that there there is enough information for businesses to be able to do that. Obviously, there's going to be a reluctance there as well, because if it is felt that maybe some businesses are the source of, of any new reinfection, that they're worrying that they're going to be snowballed again until, you know, until they can come out of that I just I, I I agree with you I think we we need to be more localized and we we nearly need to be more focused and, and targeted if if we were to have um, uh, periods of lockdown so that we don't put a you know an overwhelming sense on the whole economy to, to shut down again um, but I'm not quite sure that the things that we need to do are currently in place you know we're, we're gosh nearly a month into now emergence and I I'm not quite sure what we need to be doing is actually being done and. Um, well, it's we'll see moving forward, but you know, I would certainly like more information and more guidance to businesses if that is the key to to avoiding you know this this situation for another three months. Yeah, I mean, I think in in, in some respect, yeah, in some respects, I agree with the, the the point that you're making. I suppose there's a balance where firms have a lot to deal with, yeah, and they don't need uh, you know a deluge of more guidance coming from from uh, from government. Um, and, and so, therefore, that that balance needs to be. Um, well, you know, to be fair, it, it, I would actually um, say that they do need more guidance because I think the government has been quite limited in providing that anyway. Um, and I think, I think, for the sake of consistency, I think for the for the purpose of what Track and Trace will do, I think there there does need to almost be a process which needs to be created by government. But I, I suppose what I'm saying is is that I'm not familiar with one. Um, maybe there is. Um, I just. I, I, I've gotten frustrated over the last number of months that businesses do seem a little bit bewildered. You know, they're given instruction by government, but they don't know how to follow through on that. And I and I think, you know, that's the nervousness that I've been hearing from my constituents. And I, and I think if this is the key to um, avoiding another situation like we've had for the next three months, I would like to think our government were being proactive on providing that um, that process and that guidance. But I'm not saying it. I'm just wondering if, if anyone else has and maybe I'm, I'm in the dark. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not able. I suppose I'm not able to make it a, a different contribution to what I'd said before. We are, we tend to work in the policy making sphere, as opposed to directly with businesses. Uh, although we have spoken to, uh, on, on an ongoing basis, a number of the business umbrella organisations, and um, I do know that they are they are working as hard. As, as they can to give the, the information and guidance to their members yeah. uh, as possible. So uh, I would applaud that. Perhaps perhaps there's there's scope to, to give more support to those organisations so they in turn can help their members. That, that might be something to consider okay. moving forward. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just want one final um, question around and we've touched on it to some extent, the, the role of supply chains, I suppose, um, locally and the role then of procurement in that, in terms of, you know, um, having a focus on local supply chains or shorter, shorter supply chains, um, and also in terms of um, a joined up recovery on an all island basis, um, it's something that the likes of CBI and IBEC have been making a case around. Um, is there, a specific um, role, role for that? Is there supports that need to be developed around that um, or a process around that more formalised um, in terms of planning for recovery? Um, I think that, and it's, it's one of the points that we made, uh, I think it was in the first paper, uh, was you know, one of the outcomes of uh, of this pandemic is that um, governments uh, and businesses are going to want to shorten and simplify um, their their supply chains, um, and um, you know who would have thought three or four months ago that PPE uh, and being reliant on China for you know a, a significant portion of the PPE that that we use would become a national strategic issue um, but but clearly it has um, and so therefore I, I think that what we're going to see is a much broader range of goods and services that where security of supply is is seen as a, is a much bigger issue now um, where that 
then comes into play, I think, for, for your, your committee and, and, and for the executive, is the potential that that gives for, for Northern Ireland to become a, a location for, excuse me, a, a location for um, investment, inward investment, foreign direct investment from businesses that can deliver uh, those types of products and services and, and manufacture them in Northern Ireland. It's much closer to home, much more reliable partner, uh, less global trade risk, if you like. So um, I, I think that there's certainly an opportunity for uh, Invest NI to, to market Northern Ireland. Is that sort of stable, high-skilled, close-to-home um, uh, location for a, a range of um, manufacturing as well as you know the high value added service se sector um, companies that they try to attract. One one comment I would make just in terms of manufacturing and why um, I talk about manufacturing and the importance of manufacturing quite a bit. And, and one of the reasons for that is that um, manufacturing creates employment across the entire. Uh, skill spectrum. So there's lots of high skilled, high paid jobs, manufacturing, medium skilled, and, and then create, and there's a lot of uh, employment opportunities created for people with lower level qualifications. And, you know, whilst, you know, I, I would fully support um, Invest NI going out and, and, and attracting, um, you know, software companies, financial service companies, those high value added service sector companies, absolutely, you know, appropriate to, to look at those areas. Um, you know, with the best will in the world, not everyone's going to get a, a, a job working in, in, in software or uh, other high skill jobs. They don't have the, the academic wherewithal, uh, but they do have different skills that um, are suited to different sectors and, and different industries. And, and manufacturing is one of the sectors that, that provides opportunities, job opportunities for people across that skills and qualification spectrum. So I think that this is a, it's going to be a sort of a medium to longer term play. Clearly, this isn't a step that can be taken immediately. But I do think that one of the trends we're likely to see is that things are going to be made closer to home than would have been the case, you know, six, 12 months ago. Just one point here on the All Island piece. I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, I think one of the one of the points I suppose you could make on on that, or it would be fair to make, is that the the recovery, you know, the, the speed of the recovery on both parts of the island will be will be critical to the other part of you know what I mean. So there's a a sense here we're very we'll be very invested in how quickly the the south is able to um, recover both employment and um, output, given the kind of cross border supply chains we see in the likes of food um, construction was mentioned earlier pharmaceuticals as well so that that that'll be something i think um i, I would certainly urge you know that that's kind of that is pushed well up the agenda at any nsmc sectoral meetings as we go ahead in terms of what coordination can be done there between the two departments um the department of business i think it's business and and enterprise in the south and dfe in the north so i think that's something that nets needs to be kind of kept well up the agenda there to some extent where we may have strengths and you mentioned um, there Gareth in particular the, 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 the likes of PPE but medical devices is something that uh, in the south that is very well developed there is a, a very strong manufacturing sector in terms of medical devices so in terms of joining those things up um, and creating that supply chain across the island um, and exploiting those strengths is, I think that there are great opportunities in, in that respect yeah um, okay, I think that's us in terms of questions. Um, look, thank you very much um, for your presentation. It has been really useful to us. Um, and I'm sure we'll be back in touch with you again soon and keeping an eye on what your uh, feeding out is as well. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I would say we are doing some uh, other uh, research and, and as we uh, publish that, well, it goes up on our website, but I'm, I'm quite happy to, to share it with, uh, with your committee uh, and, and, um, and, and your clerks for, for your information. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Just a bit of... Flexing around there. <laughs>
Okay, so... Chair, we don't have decision-making quorum. Um, we only had the minute of four members. Um, we didn't get John Stewart. Um, he hasn't come back into us, so we aren't in a position um, to proceed with business that requires decisions. Okay, so is there anything we can proceed with? No, because everything requires decisions, Chair. <laughs> no coffee and no decisions. <laughs> okay, so... So if we move to um, adjournment. Okay. Apologies for that. That's okay, it's not your fault. Okay, so members, um, we'll be in touch in terms of the next meeting. Thanks. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks, Bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.